Ladder 7 4, Ladder 11, Engine 5 1, Engine 17, Engine 14, Battalion 13, Battalion 12, A 12, Engine 13. Respond on fire for for commercial fire. Read and see what apartments 1401 South 18th Street. Fire 4, Battalion 13. Battalion 13, Fire 4. I'll be responding with a delay from the Port of Seattle Airport. Fire 4, Battalion 7 4. Battalion 7 4. Yeah, I'm clear to last. Can you add me to uh, Renton's fire with ladder 74? We're getting multiple RPs on this reporting a building on fire, unknown number of units affected, possibly building 16 at Regency Woods. is reporting that animals are being thrown out of a window at one of the units. Fire 4, engine 13. Engine 13, fire 4. Column. The Regency Woods fire uh, was the biggest incident that I have run to date. Uh, it could be the, one of those career incidents, could be the biggest incident I've ever run. Today I'm going to go review some things from my perspective, things that went well for me, things that didn't go as well as I'd like, and hopefully from the process today uh, you can learn and uh, uh, run the incident better than I did or improve your incident command skills. We're going to cover a couple basic things. I'm going to give you uh, some incident background, some premise history, um, some of the resources we use, we use a lot, and then uh, I'm going to go do a command review, kind of my thought process through the entire ordeal. So a little incident background, the Regency Wood Apartment Complex uh, was built in 81. We've inspected it a year ago. Uh, this whole complex is tight. The roads are tight to the complex. It's next to an inner urban interface between wildland and apartment complexes. Uh, we had 80 degree plus days uh, for 12 days in a row. Uh, winds at the time of the incident were gusting from uh, 17 to 30 miles an hour, and I swear as soon as I got there to do my 360, they were 30 plus. It was just blowing hard. And when you read about a wind-driven fire in the NIST studies and all the documentation, this was clearly a pure definition of a wind-driven fire that, that we were fighting. So the unit that was in fire was uh, 12 units, three stories high. These are non-sprinklered buildings. And by the time I did my 360 in my command vehicle, we already had the exposure on the C. Charlie side of the structure was half involved uh, with flames. Uh, the initial dispatch was at 1347 for this fire. It came in as a commercial fire. So we had four engines, two ladders, a couple of battalion chiefs, and an A crew dispatch. The first in engine company upgraded to a working fire incident and a 10-minute timer to get the clock rolling. And we actually, by 1407, had called full, full alarms to this. And because of the activity in the zone and us draining so many resources, we weren't able to fill uh, the fourth alarm of the incident. Uh, multiple calls, large thermal column was visible from many, many miles away. Uh, initial actions uh, by Engine 13, who was first on location, and their response time was uh, eight minutes and nine seconds to get there. They reported a large multifamily occupancy fully involved, and they said it appeared evacuated. They pulled a couple, two and a half, and they went into a defensive strategy and were attacking the fire from uh, side C of the structure, which we ended up calling side A later on. And then engine 14 came in right behind them and established uh, 18th command. Fire 4, engine 13. Engine 13, fire 4. Engine 13 on location, large, multi-family occupancy, fully involved fire, pairs evacuated. Engine 13 is pulling up two and a half. Beside C. Charlie, we're in the defensive mode. Fire 4, engine 14. Engine 14, fire 4. On location, establishing East Command. Copy engine 14, on location, establishing East Command at 1356. Uh, I arrived on location at 1359. Uh, I confirmed uh, with engine, four, uh, engine 14 to assume command uh, what their actions were, what engine 13's actions were, and then we did a formal uh, transfer command. Uh, we kept it as a defensive strategy. At that time, I called another a third alarm, and like I mentioned earlier, we had a fourth uh, pretty quickly. And I got to tell you, when I arrived, I was like, holy cow. It actually took me minutes to do, a minute when I was doing my 360 to figure out what was going on and what my incident action plan was going to be because of Rolled on a lot of fires, and most of the time I get there, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this, 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 this. And this one, it actually took me a couple minutes to figure out what the plan was going to be. Try 12 on scene, do that 360. Got it. Command is 11 at a hydrant at the intersection of uh, 18th and the cross. All right, hang on. I got to get a, a feel for this. We got a lot of fire in one building, and we have another one ready to catch up fire. Hang on. Fire 
4, Titan 12. Titan 12, Fire 4. 360 complete, gonna be transferring command. Titan 12 is gonna command at 1359. You can see the shingles on the next apartment building over starting to slough off. Engine 14 from command. Three half, engine 14. Here you have command, let me know what you, assignment you've made so far. Understand, engine 13 has supply, they have a two and a half on side A of the structure attacking and engine 11 is setting up their stick on side B of the structure. Command is engine 14, go ahead. Play two, two and a half off of engine 13, bring a deck, guy, deck gun up to the A Adam, D David corner of the structure, and you'll protect exposure C Charlie. Bring a deck gun, supply by two, two and a half, to Alpha, Delta, to protect the Charlie exposure. Primitive. Resources. You know, we called for a lot of resources, and I didn't really realize how many resources I called for until I was uh, going back over the incident, writing my incident action report, and getting ready for this after actions review that we presented. But we called uh, eight, but there was eight battalion chiefs that ended up there, 17 engine companies, six ladder companies. We had four aid crews, six medic units, a couple MSOs. We had a uh, brush strike team, and we had eight different brush rigs total. We had four strike teams. We had from uh, Zone 1 uh, in the east side, Zone 5, Seattle, and Pierce and Snohomish County. And we used all, we used three of those uh, strike teams actually at the incident, and then we kept Snohomish County in reserve to help cover the rest of the Zone 3 or South County. We had one rescue unit, two rehab units, and we ended up setting up three rehab areas. Two air units, uh, two PIOs who did a fantastic job. Fire Chiefs 11, 12, 74, and 20, and uh, Chief 74 ended up being my demobilization officer. Uh, Chief 12 became the planning. Uh, we had four zone three coordinators who managed the rest of the zone as I was draining all the resources out of our zone at South King County. Uh, we had a fire investigator, and then we moved into uh, Tuck Willow's mobile command unit. It was a great resource that helped us even better organize the incident once it arrived. Other agencies, Renton PD, who had handled all the evacuation. Then Public Works, we had water and storm water. And the water department was great redirecting water into our area because we ended up flowing over um, half a million gallons of water at this incident. Red Cross for all the displaced people. Uh, Regency Wood Management, um, the co complex managers helped us tremendously. And then of course Puget Sound Energy who helped us with all the power lines we were dealing with. So just so you have a little perspective and try to give you a layout, we had the main fire building, um, which was 12 units, which was fully involved when we got there. And then we had the C1 exposure. Uh, C2 exposure and B1 exposure, that's how we named them at the command post. And the C1 exposure, um, which is four units, was well involved. And we ended up having 20 units that uh, were involved in the fire. So we had the initial apartment complex, and then we had fires that were almost two miles away. We had apartment complexes threatened. We had neighborhoods threatened that we evacuated. And then we had the Bonneville Power uh, main substation right in the middle of this uh, urban interface fire. Uh, my decision process is what we teach in our curriculum. It's what our officers use for the initial short report and incident commanders use at the command post. And it's my, the critical factors trying to determine those, what my strategy is going to be, what risk management I have, and the, come up with my incident action plan and then my tactical priorities. As I was going through my decision process, the first one is the critical factors. And there's the th eight critical factors. The th th first three are fixed, the building, the arrangement, the occupancy. The building, like I talked about, there are three stories, uh, multifamily. 20 units, excuse me, 12 units in some, four units in the other. The arrangement, um, they're tight together, so we have exposure problems. Driveways are tight. It's hard to get all the apparatus in to where you want them, and water supply, water supply is laid. Occupancy, uh, multifamily, multifamily, we can just assume most of the time there's people at home, so we're going to have people coming out of those mostly occupancies, and we're going to have lots of people viewing the fire. The next set of critical factors I was thinking about were the fire, the life hazard, the resources, the actions, and then special circumstances. And special circumstances includes weather, and we had high winds, which had a dramatic effect uh, on the fire. Uh, actions, the effect that there are, and I was thinking of the effects of that first couple companies, what their uh, two and a half and monitors were doing, not much because of the volume of fire. Life hazard, we had a lot of people around. We had an immediate call for CPR, so I wore my EMS needs. What are we going to do with all those people that we evacuated? And then the fire, where's it going? How much is left to burn? How much is it had burned? 
Well, as we found out, it had burned 12 units. It had a two more exposure, three more exposure units that it wanted to burn, and it had lots of brush fires that it wanted to burn. As I continued down my decision process, the strategy, we were definitely defensive in the fire unit and we were defensive in the C1 exposure, but we were offensive in the C2 and B1 exposure. And as the information came to the command post, we were offensive as we were trying to protect another whole apartment complex and other apartment buildings and neighborhoods that we were evacuating. So we had a, a two-pronged thing, defensive at the fire buildings and then we were offensive as we were trying to protect neighborhoods and other apartment complexes. Uh, risk assessment, uh, we, there wasn't much risk we wanted to do at the fire building. Like I said, that was defensive, but we had a lot to save in whole neighborhoods and whole other apartment complexes. My incident action plan changed a couple times. Information was coming in the command post, uh, rapid fire, which made me change it. As a matter of fact, a couple times I thought, are you kidding me? I thought I was maybe on candid camera. I was looking around. It's like, it's like the tactical you practice in the, in the station where the, your chief just throws all this stuff at you and you're, you're thinking to yourself, this is ridiculous. This stuff never happens. Well, I'm here to tell you it actually does happen. And it happened to me. And be advised, it looks like we've got grass fires that have hopped across uh, 18th and are now burning in the wooded area across the street. Uh, it looks like we have CPR in progress by police. We have fire spread to the east of the build, uh, fire building at building 1201 and 1308 on Thomas Lane. That's unaddressed at this time. We have fire spread in the trees going down Grant to additional buildings on the other side of the road. I'm on 18th. It looks like the fire is uh, moving down into some units on the north side of 18th. Can you the bowling house fire 1626 Grant Avenue South? You got to send a different alarm to that. I'm overwhelmed. Tommy. Tommy, command's advising cross potential on site. See Charles D. David, corner of the fire building. All units at a perimeter. So my problems are my incident action plan. For the main fire building, we, we are defensive using master streams. For the fire and the C1 exposure, we're defensive in master streams. And then the C, uh, C2, C3, and actually the B1 exposure, uh, we were trying to protect those, and we did with master streams and hand lines. Uh, the possible occupants we had in the exposures, we were just trying to locate them using a primary search. Uh, the wildland fire, we were offensive in the wildland fires with uh, hand lines and master streams and brush teams and hand tools. The neighborhood exposures, we were trying to protect those with master streams and hand lines. We actually uh, evacuated uh, ex uh, some of the neighborhoods. And then the weather, we just continued to monitor the weather. Uh, rehab was a major concern, and we ended up setting up three rehab units for all the firefighters, and then resources, uh, the uh, Valleycom, strike teams, uh, zone coordinator were some of the resources that we used. We had several safety concerns, uh, number one being the high winds, the way it was driving the fire into the fire buildings and exposing neighborhoods. Uh, we had collapse of the main fire building was a concern. We actually put out uh, alert tones to get people to clear away from the main fire building, make sure we had a good um, perimeter. Exertion of firefighters, it was a hot day. Uh, we were using lots of them. That's why we ended up setting, setting up three rehab units. The train of the land, the high tension power line from Bonneville Power, and then the transition from the structure fire to the interface fire was also a concern. He's burning in apartment complex, in our apartment complex. I hope it's not gonna go to our side. Basic command structure we had, we had the IC and we had an aide there, we had PIOs, safety officer, and then we had uh, four divisions. We had Charlie, uh, Delta, 18th, and Grant, and then we established one branch, which was 8th branch, and they were, their main responsibility was to protect the uh, Falcon Ridge uh, neighborhood. As the incident went on, uh, we set up a planning section and we developed uh, work periods. The first work period went from the start of the fire to 1800 in the evening, excuse me, 2000 in the evening because we basically wanted everybody out of the brush area at that time. Then we set up a uh, work period for the uh, evening hours till 0600 the next morning. They basically monitored the fire building, some investigation and all the brush fires and protecting the neighborhoods. And then we had the last portion which was uh, the final investigation overhaul portion and continuous spot fires which made the incident last uh, 30 hours. We had a demobilization plan that was put together and then we also the, had the zone three coordinators who did a great job of helping the incident commander with 
myself, the incident commander, with uh, resources. And then because we emptied the, zone, the whole zone, they did a great job of getting people back into the zone to handle the normal day-to-day -day emergencies that were happening in all the South County uh, fire departments. For logistical operations, we had uh, communications, different radio frequencies. We used uh, Fire 4, 5, 6, and 7. Um, we used to kept uh, strike teams on the radio frequency. They came in as they were assigned to branches and groups. We had a medical unit leader, uh, MSO1. He was responsible for all the crew rehab. He also did the rehab for all the police who were doing evacuation. We ended up having three separate uh, rehab locations. We had one near the command post, one at the staging area, which was at 18th and Grant, and then one up towards the uh, Lincoln Division, which turned into a Lincoln branch because we were kind of spread out at that point. Uh, we treated one patient who had CPR, Letter 74 did that. Uh, we had one, one firefighter released from the scene um, and then one firefighter who suffered minor injuries. We used several divisions and branches throughout the incident. Uh, we helped them to organize their objectives, uh, to get those accomplished, helped us keep our span of control uh, clear and helped us with our accountability. Uh, we didn't activate all these at one time. Sometimes we had divisions that turned into branches. Sometimes the division went away after we met the objectives for that division. To help give you some perspective, uh, you can see Charlie and Delta Division. Those are the two main divisions that were used to uh, fight the fire and uh, protect the exposures. Uh, neither one of those apartment complexes really had any survivable space for those apartment units. And then you can see where the command post is located. And then Grant Avenue and South 18th Street were the main streets used. And the staging area that we talked about was at the intersection of Grant and 18th. And continuing to give you perspective, you can see where the apartment fire is located on the left of your screen, and you can see the 18th Division and the 8th Branch, um, which was created actually to protect that neighborhood from that uh, fire you see. Those were brush fires all along the Bonneville uh, power uh, right-of-ways. You can see the, where the apartment fire was going to be down on our lower left of the screen, how it jumped over 18th and then started going up and then jumped over Grant. And you can see where the staging uh, rehab, one of the rehab areas was located. We actually had three during the incident. And then in the middle of all this, towards the beginning, that first 20 minutes of the incident, the house fire I talked about, they were dispatched to house fire just to add uh, more confusion. But here's just another layout of the, the incident. We also used emergency management. Uh, our city policy, we need, uh, after a certain amount of alarms, we activate our emergency management. Uh, they assisted with some public information, uh, resources, uh, worked with our PIOs who were uh, at the incident site. Uh, they also uh, contacted the state emergency management and other counties because we had three counties who were actually involved in this because we used resources uh, just to make everyone aware of what was going on. So they were, they were helpful uh, as we went through the incident. What went well? well? We always want to talk about the good things before we talk about the lessons learned. So what went well? The dispatch center was awesome. The dispatchers that were on duty and then the dispatchers they recalled to handle the rest of the zone were great. Good communications. I don't think they missed any of my communications back to them. Um, the way they got me the resources was awesome. Uh, automatic and mutual aid, we've worked hard as a zone and a county on our automatic and mutual aid responses. Uh, from the instant command post, it, it seemed to work flawlessly. They were there quickly um, and integrated right into our system. Uh, MSO rehab and medics, I can't say enough about the MSO um, who set up all our rehab, uh, the medics who provided uh, rehab care and CPR and medical care on some of our uh, a couple of the firefighters that were injured, they were great throughout the day. And then uh, battalion chiefs, I know I'm a battalion chief, sounds like we're tooting our own horns, but the battalion chiefs that were assigned to divisions, branches, those guys were on fire. They knew their jobs, they did their jobs well, they communicated well with me, uh, gave me all sorts of great information at the command post that helped me make decisions, and we made some of those decisions on the fly just on some radio reports, so thank you for those guys, were great. And then the uh, uh, Renton PD, the evacuations, I was just given commands to fire four, which is our main tactical frequency, um, which areas we need evacuated, and they just handled the whole situation. That went really well for us. Uh, the water department, uh, George from the water department came to the command post. I told him my water needs, what we had to do, and he got more water to us. Even I talked to a couple of the pump operators, they could tell the difference when the water department, Renton Water Department, got more water flowing to our area. Uh, they filled back up our uh, reservoir, and like I mentioned earlier, we used over 500,000 gallons of water, uh, so they were great. Zone 3 coordinators, I think there was three chiefs that went to our dispatch center who handled all the coordination of, my, of the strike teams and providing service to the rest of the zone uh, as the incident went on. And then, you know, I didn't physically see this, but I heard reports of Engine 22 and Engine 53 give a shout out to both those crews. I, they stopped fires on the flank. Though I know one from going into the Woodland Complex. Uh, so great job for those guys. And then the effort, determination, commitment of everybody who was there. Uh, the way we communicated on the radio, using the order model, 
Um, we had rehab, and I know that a lot of them didn't get to rehab when they wanted to, but they just kept fighting and working on the fire. And we stopped fire from getting to three neighborhoods in one other apartment complex, which was great. And then the active 911 system, which is a new system we're demoing for me at the end of the command post, um, having that active 911 and being able to pull up the um, map system. And then the satellite pictures, so what people were telling me where these brush fires are going, I could see it on, via satellite pictures was a great help at the command post. So we talked about what went well, lessons learned. There's lots of lessons learned. So I hope you can take from things that I learned and apply them to when you run an incident. Um, overhead team. I should have called for the overhead team earlier on in the incident. It would have relieved some of the stress of the command post. So you get that planning, the demobilization, the logistics, and you just kind of work out, fill out the rest of the sections for your um, command team. That would have been a big difference. So we, getting them to the scene sooner would have been a big help. Uh, we got the mobile command unit there um, later. It would have been nice to get there earlier because once we moved into the mobile command unit, then we had the whiteboards above us so we could, everybody could see the divisions groups. Our incident action plan was laid out so everybody could see. We had uh, radios and all the radio frequencies in front of us. Me and my aide were sitting next to each other next, and then the planning and demob were all right there. It uh, allowed us to have instant weather so we knew exactly what the winds were going to do, what the projected winds were going to do, which was a huge uh, factor in this fire. Um, and then we could have the mobile, not the, mo yeah, the mobile comm up too, so we could see what was, where everybody was. So that, that would have been nice if we would have done that earlier and it was a big help. Uh, the way I organized the incident would be something that I would do different. I uh, remember I talked about a safety concern earlier about the interface between fire and then interface fire. With, there was a safety concern, the way we tied that together. I think if I would have done it different, I might have, there's a couple different ways we could have done it. We could have uh, had an IC and then had a fire branch and then a wildland fire branch and put those divisions there. Or we could have kept an IC, had an operations and then had a fire branch and, uh, excuse me, a wildland fire branch and a branch. Because that wildland fire was kind of a, you know, it was different and it kind of would get people in a different mindset if they knew they were going to a wildland fire branch. So those are a couple things that I think could have made the incident run better there as far as the structure. Safety officer, I had a safety officer at the beginning. And then, you know, I think a lot of us have our checklist or command checklist. And I checked that box off and I, in my mind, had a safety officer. And later on the incident, I re recommitted him to a different, uh, to a division. And I never got a safety officer or multiple safety officers going back, back in. So that uh, was an issue you could learn from uh, your check boxes. And then PD to the command post. Why well, PD did a fantastic job of evacuations. I should have got them to the command post earlier. So we, we made sure our coordination, our evacuations were good and they knew exactly what I was looking for. And we're kind of, we kind of dropped the ball or I dropped the ball as in this commander. Our notification back to the citizens when we could let them back in uh, to their neighborhoods, to their apartment complexes was delayed because we, we lost a little bit of that tie. So getting them back to the command post earlier would have been a big help. So another th thing we learned is uh, those are first two initial companies. Um, we knew we had a big thermal column where the fire was. But as they were coming up Puget, which was the main road to the, the fire, they had uh, people waving them in frantically to, a, to an area. And that area ended up being not at the apartment complex, but one area behind, which caused us a long lay to get those initial attack lines in, you know, over 600 feet. So trust, sometimes just trust your instinct. And if people want to help us, but sometimes they can mislead us. Uh, command post communications. We teach in our curriculum over and over again the incident commander cannot miss communications at the command post. There was a couple I missed, but one of the ones that bugged me the most was there was a, uh, I missed an emergency traffic. They had to tone me or call me a second time before I caught it. And so it's something we teach in the curriculum. Focus on your radio. That's why you have an aid and don't miss emergency um, traffic communications or any communications from your crews working. Uh, priority traffic versus uh, good news. Uh, radio frequencies were busy. We're just starting the concept of priority traffic what we want to hear on the radio. Um, we just started teaching that in our live fire, just coming through our IMS curriculum, so we need to continue to improve on that. And then uh, defensive operations management. We also teach, teach this in our IMS curriculum. Um, you have to, when it's a defensive fire, you really need to manage how your units come in and where you lay your, your supply lines. We got our first supply line in, and, and this is on me, and then it didn't allow us to get our second ladder truck in and get them supply and we have having to overhaul a lot of supply lines to get to support those structures. So um, we teach it. I can tell you it's true. So when you're doing defensive operations, you need to manage your way your rigs get in there and manage your supply lines. And then tablet command for tracking and documentation. It's just something we're starting to use, the tablet command program. 
It would have been great on this incident uh, to manage all the movement. It ties in with our Ballycom and benchmarks on there. So those are a few lessons, lessons that we've learned. Um, as, I'm sure as you watch video and you look at YouTube, um, you'll look at all of it and you'll say, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? That's great. That's how we learn. That's how we get better. Uh, when we teach IMS, that's what we do. We pull up YouTube's videos and say, hey, look at this. What should we do here? I send it to my officers all the time. Hey, well, how would you do this? What are your critical factors? What were the problems? What would be your initial attacks? So these are some of the lessons I learned. Hope you find more that you can uh, learn from our incident. There were so many complexities to this incident, the evacuation of apartment complexes and neighborhoods, the wind, the rapid fire spread, the multiple fires, the train, and then just for me, the most complex thing was just the rapid information that was coming at me, that people were feeding information to the command post so rapidly, that, that made it very complex. But I just need to thank everyone. I, mean, I may have been the incident commander, but we talk about team and a team effort. This was incredible team effort by everyone who came to the incident. Um, the battalion chiefs from the zone and uh, from the county, knowing their responsibilities and jobs and their professionalism and, and helping me at the command post and the different divisions and branches and, and groups they were in. The firefighters, what, what work ethic, what dedication. Th those guys worked long, hard, difficult hours, sometimes longer breaks from rehab than they should have. Uh, just need to thank all of them. Um, the zone and county um, plan, our strike teams, our automatic aid, our mutual aid, all worked well, stuff we planned for for a long time and it worked. Uh, the dispatch center, the professionalism of the dispatch center, the dispatchers I was working with were on top of their game, uh, gave me hints when I needed them, got information to me when I needed it. Uh, they were fantastic. The zone three coordinators that uh, went to Valleycom and then helped me some at the command post, they were, they were great. So I, I just want to thank, again, I just everyone's efforts. It's, I would consider it a successful incident, even though there is lessons we learned from all these. I think a lot of things, uh, went very well in this, this fire.